This episode is sponsored by Tattoo Smart and River Valley Printing Co. So on May 9th of this past year, there was a Dallas Observer article entitled, Nishaw Weaster Club alum creates tattoo artist internship for high schoolers. And this article caused a massive uproar in the tattoo community, as things do as, at yeah. times. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I think I'm a little familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that other voice that you hear is Tim Hendricks, who's joined me to go on a journey through the world of this article and what unfolded from it. So uh, I'm going to read through a couple points of interest in it, and then we can go from there. Hey, hi. Before we start this segment with Tim Hendricks. Hello, I'm Andrew Stortz. So this article I mentioned, the uproar, it's all real. If you remember or if you don't, it's based around tattooer Rani Lanain Fetz from Dallas, Texas. A little background about her. She went to an arts high school, was very inspired to become a real artist. She went off to art college and then realized that maybe that wasn't for her after all. So she returned home, ended up finding a tattoo apprenticeship. And as that progressed, that also turned out to be a dead end in her life. It wasn't the type of environment she wanted to be in, so she had to go it alone. She forged her own path and she became a tattooer. And for the last decade plus, she's been slinging ink in Dallas. So fast forward to now, she came up with an idea to inspire the youth at an arts high school in Dallas and she wants to show them the beauty of this world that we call tattooing. All the things it's done for her life and the opportunities it's presented, she wants to show that as a viable option for these young, budding artists. She cooked up a curriculum for a full tattoo internship for these students as part of their external studies that they do in the school. And it will teach sterilization, bookkeeping, customer service, art preparation, all the ins and outs, and even some technical stuff, but they will not be tattooing people, just fake things. And we all know how the tattoo world can react to these sorts of new and different ideas, and this was no different. So, we're going to break down some more subtleties of this article and about the situation uh, throughout this episode, so I don't want to go too much further in depth, but here's myself and Tim Hendricks. Okay. So what do you think about that? Where do I start? Um, uh, first, and I'll probably circle back to it, but uh, there's a very important part of that course that's missing in there, and that's ethics. Who's teaching them ethics? Who's teaching them that you can only learn hands-on in experience when someone comes in and says, yo, I want to get my fucking face tattooed. And you look at them and you say, okay, well, you look about 21. You don't have any tattoos on your whole body. And we're in the business of beautifying bodies, not ruining lives. And you hear certain catchphrases that, you know, older tattooers say that you would mentor under that would, you know, that would discuss it and say it in a nice way to someone to get, to get all walks of life to understand that we're in the business of beautifying bodies, not ruining lives. And although that has changed over the course of time, you know, um, it's become, it's become a little bit different, you know, I mean, Forearms were taboo when I started. And now it's like the forearms are the norm. You know, neck and face is kind of taboo. Neck's not even taboo anymore. Yeah. But I still stick by a code of ethics. And my shop, although surrounded by 10 other shops, and my shop and a couple other shops around there that know each other, we won't do things like that. But we know they're going to walk down the street and they're going to get it somewhere else. It's just not going to be from us. And we stick to that code. So I'm wondering who's going to teach them that. But... Okay, so let me pull out my phone here and look at my notes because mm -hmm. when you when you asked me to come on, I kind of had to like really take a look, an outside look, like an uh, you know, I've been in it for so long. I think it's hard for me sometimes to to take a look from an outside perspective from someone say just like uh, just an accountant, you know, who's looking, he's coming to get his tattoo. He doesn't know anything about the tattoo business, or she doesn't know anything about it. And they're coming in and they're looking at it from their perspective, someone who's not been engulfed in the culture for more than half of their life. And, um, and the one thing that, that I think anyone can agree on is that it's, 
you're you can be an artist and it helps if you're an artist but the actual business of tattooing that the act of tattooing the act of a customer comes in you you tattoo them they bring in a design from pinterest you redraw it up a little bit real quick and you tattoo them and you use your tools you know your tattoo tools which they are that's argue you know unarguably they are tools and you tattoo them and you bandage it and they leave this is a trade okay this is a trade and it's a craft and i i believe and you people can argue but i believe that it's a trade and it's a craft first um an art second you can take that art and put it on there and that's what makes great tattooers that's what makes ed hardy ed hardy you know i mean he's a real artist i'm i don't think i'm a real artist i think i'm a tattooer first and an artist second although i can do art and i worked really hard at it so i can make my craft that much more marketable and sellable so i can put food on the table for the rest of my life you know um it's a craft and it's a trade so I talked to a lot of uh, tradesmen and craftsmen and asked them what they went through to get to where they're at. I talked to pipe fitters, crane operators, electricians, plumbers, doctors, you know, I, I, um, barbers. I talked to a lot of different people and, and asked them questions about, you know, I mean, what they had to go through. I mean, a pipe fitter apprenticeship is three fucking years. No joke. Um, now I understand that she was disenchanted with apprenticeships and I mean, apprenticeships are hard and they've gotten easier. They've gotten much easier because I mean, you're competing with kids who are learning how to tattoo on YouTube. No joke. I've met a great tattooer who learned how to tattoo from watching YouTube. I'm not kidding you. So you're competing with that. <sighs> that seems like a common thread with all of these new ideas and industry disruptors that the whole the whole line that they all say in common is that they were sick of uh, you know how things have been uh, the toxic environment and all all these things or experiences that they've had and that's their justification for going outside the box yeah but you can't you can't fucking cherry pick a few different things which they're doing they're they're like cherry picking things that happened that happened in all industries and all businesses and all different trades and different lines of work and they're cherry picking those and use and, and they're, they're using those as a foothold to skip out on the work that needs to be put in to 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 be a tattooer so it's like I, I think they're using it as like some scapegoat or something to be like well i don't have to go through that and we don't have to go through that anymore it's like what do you mean you don't have to go through that you i mean I'll give you an example. When I interviewed um, an electrician family, okay, it's a father, son, like son-in-law. I mean, they're all electricians. They've been doing it their entire lives. Um, they're the, like some of the only people I, I trust to, to, to do work. And they talk to me. Now, they don't know what's going – they don't know about tattooing at all. They're just talking about their own industry. When I told them why, I was kind of asking them. I gave them a brief rundown, tattoo schools, blah, 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 this and that. It was interesting to hear both of them say, well, because they, they, so it's just two of them now. It's just the dad and the son, and they do big jobs. And so they're not capable, just two of them doing massive jobs. They, they also are contractors. So they contract other electricians to come and help them do these big jobs. And they do not hire from electricians that went to a quote unquote school. They only hire electricians who worked under another electrician and did a proper electrician apprenticeship because the ones that come from schools are dangerous. You know, they, they, they don't know on the job things. They never worked and learned a, a ton of things that you have to do hands on that you cannot learn in a school. And so they do not hire people from schools because they just always run into problems. And I found that very interesting because there's a lot of relation in tattooing to that, you know? Um, and I mean, they, you did, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta work under somebody for four fucking years to be an electrician. You know, dude, if I told you what my, my doctor that I interviewed went through, it would fucking blow your mind. I'm just going to say it right now. And this is, this is a doctor. Of course, it's a very important job, but, um, he went to med school for eight years. So this is the start of it off. So he went to four years. He got his bachelor's degree. Then he went to med, then he went to four years of medical school. 
And then he went to, and by the way, this is somebody who didn't graduate from high school. I'm not kidding you. Hmm. Um, then he did his residency. So his residency is a minimum of three years. But if you're doing like a surgical residency, then you do it for seven years. If you're going to be like a heart surgeon, a brain surgeon, and uh, he does cardiology. So you have to do, you have to do all that. And then you have credential body, uh, credential body test. So you like you're testing every step of the way. Every time you reach another level, you're doing tests to make sure that you know every bit of information. And if you fail that test, any of those tests, you're out. So you could really like reach this higher level and then you just didn't make it because that was your limit. You know, that was like the max capacity of how good you were going to be at yeah. this. Um, and then you have a, a credential body, which is elected officials. So this is an interesting one too. When I started talking to all these people, I was like, well, who, who says that, like who, who sets the standard for this? Like who sets the standard of who's teaching who and who is apprenticing who and who gets, who's a journeyman or who's this. And like nine times out of 10, they all came back with elected officials. And I'm like, okay, well, what's this group, woman's name again? Hannah Fest. Fest. Who elected Hannah Fest? Who? Nobody. Nobody. Who? Uh, uh, and I said, well, how, who are these elected officials to? I, 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 you know, I wanted to know about them. They said these are people with like 20 plus years experience, 25 plus years experience. They've worked in the industry for this long. They have a, a great record. So they don't have, you know, they don't have like, they're not breaking eth ethics codes of their business. They just have a really good reputation uh, and on paper. It's, you know what I mean? It's all there in black and white. And, um, and so it's like, well, who elected and if it's a 25 year tattooer? If you were to tell tw a bunch of 25-year tattooers what she's doing, how many of those – and I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to like speculate on this, but I'm going to leave this up to whoever's listening. How many of those are going to say, oh, yeah, I think she should do this? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think many of them are going to do that. I, that's my opinion. So that's my speculation on it. Um, but uh, – I mean, but this is the problem is that who's there's no one really regulating this because we've all wanted to be fucking pirates for so long that nothing has been organized. Now, there is some people trying to organize it. And uh, and I've been looking in to seeing like what it takes to make this legitimate enough. Not that I am going to do it, but research is the key to see if that's a decision, you know, you want to make and get a bunch of people involved. But Imagine if we could vote on elected officials that could, you know, say, well, no, that tattoo school can't be here. And then we could have the control of it. But then that comes, it's a double edged sword that comes with legitimizing a pirate industry, you know? But I mean, back to the apprenticeship thing, man. Apprenticeships really aren't that bad anymore. They, you hear all these tales about it and. You know, people doing other people's laundry, getting whipped in the shop. I mean, just like these crazy things. Yeah. But, you know, this this was a pirate industry. And and I think that if you don't have to be that way anymore and you don't even have to, you don't even have to, you don't even, I mean, you kind of have to acknowledge that's the way it was and you have to accept that that is the way it was and that certain things were wrong. It's a very sexist industry. It's been a sexist industry for a very long time. You know, but I mean, this is the industry she chose and she has to acknowledge that this is the way it was and that we all kind of acknowledge that, yeah, these things don't, these things don't fly anymore. This isn't right. A lot of these, these old school ways of doing it. And, you know, obviously fucking sexual harassment is not okay in the industry, you know, and that's, that's, that's kind of going, you know, a, a worldwide, it's spreading worldwide, which I think is fucking great. You know, it's, it's healthy. And so for someone in, in Fessy shoes, um, if she has experienced these things still today, then what does it leave someone like her to do? Like trying to look at it from her perspective. Yeah. Like you can understand how, if, if that has been her experience, even still within the past decade, then to me, it makes sense why she could feel a little bit on the periphery of like the core of tattooing to be comfortable and confident in doing her own thing. Well, I, I can see how she would arrive in the place she's in. 
Yeah. I mean, what is what is it? Some kind of like rebellious thing against the norm of tattooing? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about what I experienced because I was in Dallas and I was able to meet up with her. And she had me meet her at in high school of the arts. And her and another teacher who I think is helping uh, make this thing happen with her, they gave me a tour of the school. And it was pretty interesting in that the school is no joke. And from what I heard from people down there that... No they, joke how? Like It's like serious. The kids go through a pretty rigorous um, process to get accepted. It's like college. It's like going to a college. Okay. Where you have to like present a portfolio or audition if it's for music or dance. How many kids dance. were enrolled? In the school? Yeah. This is like a big school. No, but in that course. Oh, I'll get to that. Okay. So going through the school... Um, cause I went to music school, so I know what a music and arts kind of college looks like. And it looked exactly the same, except mm-hmm. there's little high school kids in there and they've got an outdoor like metal shop area and woodworking and drawing and painting and sculpting. And there's like sculptures all around the school and, the, and you can tell the kids are just a little more mature and tuned in. Like, you, you know, when you meet a kid who is like comfortable around adults and you're just like, Oh, okay. Like it's a school yeah. full of kids like that, that are like grown up a little faster, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then going through the music wing, it's like, if they're so smart, why do they want to become tattooers? Well, that's a, that's like a whole <laughs> other podcast. We, <laughs> I had the same thought too, because they all seem to have a lot of talent and a lot of like grooming them to become artists from a younger age. Uh, yeah. That I think that a lot of kids get the opportunity for. Um, but I had heard that, um, like rich Texas parents will, get a condo in Dallas just to establish an address in town so they can get their kids accepted into like the dance program or whatever. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's a big Very deal. common in any nice school. Yeah. So it's competitive. It's like, it's the jam for that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and so she showed me around the school and told me a bit about the history and showed me where they do their art shows and what's required of them. And they have to do their senior show and you know, all the, you know, how everything works. And then I met the, kids who were going to be involved in this program and uh, when I met up with her it was I think one week or maybe even less after the Dallas Observer article came out and every like it just imploded on her which I'm sure she didn't fully expect the backlash that she got yeah really it, how could she not expect that I'm, I mean I'm sure she did but to feel the weight of it I'm sure is always going to be shocking no matter yeah. what even if you think you're prepared for it um So I found talking to the kids, they were a little rattled by it because people were like tattooers were finding through links and different posts and stuff online. They were finding the Instagram profiles of these kids, high school kids and like commenting and shitting on them on their page. That's not good. Not good at all. Yeah. And so I tried to explain. You need to educate them, not intimidate them. They're not the problem. Of no. course, they, they're they high school art students. Of course, they want a tattoo. Yeah. They're just kind of like innocent pawns in, in a much larger, you know what I mean? A much larger game. They don't understand yeah. what's going on. Right. You know? They're just following they're an kids. opportunity that's being presented to them. Yeah. Yeah. They need, they need, to, they need just to be taught the right way, not my, in my opinion, the wrong way. <laughs> right. So I talked to them and tried to, I don't know, kind of put them at ease because they were really like spooked by it. And they were even nervous for me to be in the room with them because they didn't know what I was going to be like. They just saw some tattooed guy and they're like, oh shit, is he going to come insult us or like freak out or yell at us? Or they didn't know. So I tried to explain to them why the reaction was what it was, you know, to try to educate them in that sense or at least give them some understanding. So hopefully they didn't like take things personally, which I'm sure is difficult as a 17 year old kid or however old they are. So that was definitely eye opening. Um, I was, going there in hopes of interviewing in Fetzi that day. And it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. She wasn't really comfortable with it yet. And she was still mulling it over if she wanted to do the podcast or not. And so we just kind of left it. We, she had to meet with someone. She's probably worried about just re uh, like restarting that fire. Yeah. She doesn't want to say the wrong thing, but at the same time she wants to clear some of the air because she told me that some, but if she's so sorry to interrupt, but if she's so confident of what she's doing and she believes in it, then, then she should just say what she feels and the truth. She shouldn't dance around anything that would be the wrong thing. Which is what I if told her. If you truly believe in what you're doing, then you shouldn't have to worry about what you say. Right. 
I agree. And that was kind of the line that I took with her to try to encourage her that, because uh, she said stuff in the article wasn't exactly, you know, when you get interviewed for something, it's not always yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. how They it can is. cut things and manipulate it to, to yeah, I know all about that. Yeah. You know. Right. And when a, a writer who doesn't necessarily understand tattoos or internships or apprenticeships or whatever, then they could use wording that might make something terrible in our eyes or, or not or whatever. So uh, we left each other and I hoped that she would reconsider. And so the next day she decided to meet with me. And that day I met with her at her studio where she tattoos in, uh, it's like this little art gallery and there's um, like a dance studio or like a theater person has a studio there and, and then like a trash artist. It's just like a collective of like, kind of like outside artists kind yeah. of people-ish. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's got her little tattoo studio in there where she works. And so right now I will play for you guys that conversation with Infest. You may have noticed that I have been censoring the name of this woman as well as the school that she is developing this program for. And that, unfortunately, is because I am not able to include her interview in this episode. And I've been working on trying to get the clearance for it, but when dealing with a school like this, it's more or less just out of my hands. So, out of respect to her and to them, uh, I took the names out because the specifics really aren't the point. Uh, it's more about this discussion about apprenticeships, how people are learning tattooing, and this new idea of it. Coming up after the break, we'll go back and we'll talk more with Tim. and. Even though we're lacking the, the other side of this conversation, which it's such a bummer because this was a very balanced and strong episode that I was super excited for everyone to hear. This is exactly the kind of conversation that I like to present on this show. But I think that while I talked to this woman, I represented Tim's point of view as a way to discuss with her. And I, I really feel like with Tim, I made sure to present her ideas and try to clear up some stuff. So we still get some of that other side, but we'll have to make do without it. So you'll hear more of that right after these words. A big thank you to Tattoo Smart for sponsoring this episode. And I want to tell you a little bit about their new Spit Shading Toolkit. This is the most comprehensive digital toolkit to replicate traditional watercolor painting. It includes digital watercolor papers, lining and inking, and watercolor brushes. High resolution textured papers that replicate the cold press watercolor papers preferred by tattooers for decades to paint flash. What all this means is that you can now download this spit shading toolkit from Tattoo Smart, and your digital paintings will look as authentic as possible and the first time I saw this toolkit being used, I was actually blown away. This truly looks, and I'll show some examples on the screen if you're watching this, you can really see the texture of the paper, the way that the ink blends. It's, it has a very authentic look from this toolkit, and uh, I was pretty blown away. The ink and lining brushes replicate the density, ink flow, and size of traditional ink pens. And the watercolor brushes used as Procreate Standard or Smudge allow you to precisely blend color and recreate the iconic tint gradient of traditional painted flash. You kind of have to see it to believe it. So check out TattooSmart.com for the spit shading toolkit, as well as all the Tattoo Smart tools and tutorials. And to sweeten the deal and get you over there even quicker, make sure that you use coupon code BOOKSCLOSED for 15% off all Tattoo Smart products. So that's tattoosmart.com. Use that code books closed for 15% off your purchase and get designing today with the spit shading toolkit. And if you do, make sure you tag me at books closed podcast so I can see what you made. A huge thank you to River Valley Printing Co. for sponsoring this episode. And if you remember, getting a little nostalgic here, they were my first sponsor. I ever had on this podcast and now they're back river valley printing co offers prints pins and stickers basically the starter pack for what you need to be a merch monster in the tat game and i've personally ordered 
uh, plenty of stuff through River Valley. And Dan, the owner, has always been super accommodating and eager to make sure that I'm not only getting the highest quality of all these things, because I don't know papers. I don't know what the difference is. They, whenever you get prints made, the printer wants to tell you all about the paper. I don't know this stuff. But River Valley Printing Co., they're on it. So they know how to balance quality, value, all that stuff to make sure that you are making the most money on your prints that you're selling once you get them. So on and so forth. You understand. And you can check out rivervalleyprintingco.myshopify.com because they also offer prints from other artists' work. So if you just want some stuff to hang on the wall as well, they got you covered. If you use coupon code BOOKSCLOSED, that's all one word, coupon code BOOKSCLOSED, you can receive 15% off of your first order. And find them on Instagram at River Valley Printing Co. I'm sure local shops are really stoked about that. Just a bunch of kids every single time of the year around the same time all trying to come in with like resumes and you know and portfolios of their art and all that i mean it's they're actually going to get worse treatment on you know unfortunately for them they're going to get worse treatment than if they were just to come in as you know what i mean a failed a dropout high school student with a portfolio and a humble attitude and asking for an apprenticeship you know, which they shouldn't even ask for. They should just come in and ask to sweep up the floors now and then for fucking free. Well, and you let, know what I mean? Yeah. And then they'll be like, actually, we need a helper. And it's a paid position, you know, but, you know, why don't you be a helper or whatever? And then maybe hope for that opportunity that may be offered to them, mm -hmm. but never once say it. To play devil's advocate. I mean, one of those kids could be humble. Yeah, yeah it's, all, totally. it's, it's always possible. Totally, but they but they're not gonna they're gonna get the, you, no no tattoo shop and I'm just gonna like right off the bat I'm nice to everyone who comes in the door I look at everyone's tattoo portfolio when they're looking for a job because a lot of guys did that to me and I remembered that that was nice you know I appreciated that and so I look at everyone's portfolio and I send them off but I don't expect everyone to be that way and uh, if these kids are going around Dallas after they get out of a a tattoo program that they did in high school no one's gonna take them seriously. Everyone's going to sh shun them, you know, away. They're going to have to move like cities and then just say that they never went to any of this and don't know any of this information, whatever it is she's teaching them and do it like that. You know what I mean? So like, so what's the point? What becomes the point then of even doing this entire program? You know, I'm right. a, which I think is always the argument against tattoo schools. Because it's like you're marked from the second you leave that. If you walk into the shop with your tattoo school diploma, like yeah, you're better off. I would not. never hire somebody that went to a tattoo school. What if they had a great attitude and they were a great client of yours that you liked? It doesn't matter. Here's the reason why. I mean, that's not what's in question here. When when you go to a tattoo school, I, I heard this a long time ago, and I've heard it time and time again about a lot of Japanese tattoo apprenticeships. And, um, and older Japanese tattooers, when they apprentice someone, they, they actually would prefer someone, and some of them insist rather than prefer, uh, someone who has no artistic training at all. The reason why is because now you have to eliminate everything they've learned, break them down to nothing, and rebuild. And when you have someone with no artistic knowledge of any kind or no knowledge of tattooing of any kind of the craft of it, then you can build from scratch. So if there's somebody that goes to this school, I don't know what they've been taught, whether it's actually okay or not. I'm assuming that most of it is, is not too worthwhile. So now I'm going to have to break this person of tons of bad habits of tons of knowledge that is, that they're going to think they know when they really don't. And that, that could get them in a lot of trouble. That could lead them down a dangerous road. <clears throat> so how am I supposed to erase their memory of all this shit they learned that's not good? That's not going to help them at all. Or bad habits, get them to break bad habits. Some people never break bad habits. They're just kind of like develop it the way the brain works. That's how it works. When you develop a habit, you know how hard it is to redevelop something you know what I mean? For that same process that's different. I mean, for some, it's impossible. Their brain just won't allow it to happen. So 
I would much rather work with someone who, I mean, obviously they have to have a humble attitude, a good work ethic, you know, all of the above, you know, no matter who it is, but I'd rather work with somebody that has that, but also no experience when it comes to tattooing whatsoever. You know, if I'm going to teach them and, uh, I mean, that's just the way I personally would do it. I think a lot of people out there listening right now would agree. You know, that like they wouldn't hire anyone from tattoo school for those same reasons. Have you ever had an apprentice? I've had two apprentices. Um, they both happened in a nat natural, organic way. I had one apprentice. Um, he, it, was, it was very like unexpected. It was my friend from Hawaii and, um, and he did a proper apprenticeship. He... And he did it. He did things that I knew he was never going to need. Like he learned to make needles. He made like I just said, "Look, dude, you're never going to need this anymore." But you, I just really want this this trade to be passed down so that you know it. And uh, he made like a hundred threes, a hundred fives, a hundred sevens, and a, and like a hundred mags. And I was like, "Okay, you're fine." I think the hundred mags just about broke his soul. Um, <laughs> but he did it. He did it. He put them in a drawer, and he used a couple of them, you know. But um. But, uh, and he thought, thank God I can buy these. I know, right? <laughs> Dude, seriously. Uh, I mean, you know what? I did, I did something that I didn't do for myself. Was I made him wear a respirator when he was making them. You know? I'm like, yeah, oh, consider my it. God. I made <laughs> thousands of these things with no respirator because I was an idiot. But he did that. He made, um, he made his own tattoo machines. Uh, he cut both side plates out of a hacksaw. The first one was pretty elaborate. The second one was a simple V because he was not about to hacksaw all that stuff and grind it all out. And he hand filed the whole thing. Um, uh, he made his own power supply, clip cord, foot switch, all of it, you know, and, and he used the stuff. But he uh, actually unfortunately suffered with um, mental illness and he committed suicide like three years ago. But I had another apprentice. I miss him dearly. I do. But um, I had another apprentice. And this kid, his name's Brian Black, and he works for uh, Oliver Peck in Dallas now. And he is fucking great. I am so proud of him. I'm proud of both of them, you know, but this, this kid is killing it. Um, and he, uh, he hit me up when he was really young, and he asked me to teach him, and I said, no, I don't really I don't have the time for it. And he would just keep hitting me up, just constantly, constantly asking me and asking me and asking me. And I was like, look, dude, I'm... I'm just not in a position. I'm traveling all the world. I was high all the time too. Then I mean, I'm sober now. I've been sober for a really long time, but I was just like drunk and high. And I just, I would have been a bad teacher for him. Um, and then he went to art school. He actually got accepted to the Laguna Academy of Art and he went there and his art teachers could not, they could not wrap their mind around the fact that he was only going to art school to better his hone his his artistic ability so that way he could be a better tattooer in his craft later. They were like, you're in one of the best art schools in California. And, you know, why would you want to? And he's just like, this is what I want to do. And he did. He like he went he went to the Laguna Academy of Art and then. He sat me down for lunch. He said, can I buy you lunch? And I knew he was poor. So we like went out to like Wahoos or something like that. I don't know. And he bought me lunch and he said, look, I need to, I need to know if this is going to be a possibility because I want to apprentice and I have an, I have somebody to offer me, but it's not a very good shop. And I just, if I'm going to learn this, I want to learn it from you. And I was like, all right, I'll teach you how to tattoo, you know? And I didn't really need to teach him much. You know, he was such a good apprentice. He just needed to, he just needed me there to kind of guide him. He was just such a hard worker and I agreed to it and he came in and he sat and he, I mean, that kid must've wound a thousand coils for me and he would come in and work for me for four or five hours and I would just give him like gas money and food and everything to pay for the day. Um, and he, you know, he built his own machines. He, he built one time he stayed at my house and I got home and he built me a tattoo machine and left it and just said, thanks for everything. You know, I was like, man, this is so awesome. I'm so glad I taught him this. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then he worked, I think, you know, I think, I think his first, this is crazy. His first real tattoo shop job was spotlight tattoo. And he was working a spotlight and, uh, 
and Spotlight, you you kind of, it's one of those shops you have you you really kind of have to have your own appointments. There is walk-ins, of course, but you, you want your own appointments there. And it was hard for him to develop appointments, being fresh out of the gate. And uh, he just wanted to tattoo every day, all the time. And then Oliver Peck called me up, and he said, uh, "Hey, I'm looking. For, I need somebody. I need like a walk-in guy." I say, "Okay, I have someone for you. He's not a great tattooer yet, but he's a good." good human being he is the hardest worker you'll ever meet and as you mean just as as a person i vouch for him 100 percent. and he's a really fast learner and he does clean nice tattoos he's like well if you say if you vouch for him then i'll take him and he went out there and he's been crushing it i mean he what he lacks in the ability of like art and and certain other things he makes up for in hard work and he will beat anyone anyone in hard work i know he's like mike rubendahl you know like mm-hmm. as far as the work ethic goes he will just fucking outwork anyone um i'm really afraid because he's got a bad posture and i went through spine stuff and i know he's probably going to go through it because he works i mean he'll just sit in a bad position for 12 hours a day and just tattoo 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 but um i'm really proud of him that's that's a long answer for or you know long answer for for your short question there well i think it's good it gives some context i think to the whole discussion yeah and i wrote a piece i actually wrote something on my instagram when the tattoo school thing kind of was exploding there was the first one that kind of hit the internet and honestly man i'm not on instagram that much probably a way less than people think i post in bail Mm -hmm. um but i wanted to do a post on it and and i wanted to come at it at an angle that appealed to kids learn you know thinking about tattooing um and not that i wanted to discourage them but i wanted them to know you know the facts about it and 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 a positive way of saying why tattoo schools are bad rather than just screaming and yelling you know which screaming and yelling is good sometimes i mean look like like i said before they're exercising the right of protest and that has happened in front of tattoo schools and it's gotten tattoo schools closed down Mm -hmm. which i admire and i totally advocate and and agree with Um, but so I did a post and I just wrote about his apprenticeship. I took a photo and it was a photo that him and I took, uh, next to Tom DeVita, you know, and I, and it's one of my favorite photos. Cause it's like, man, I got a photo of me and my apprentice with Tom DeVita, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I just wrote a nice thing about it. And I just said, this is what he went through and this is what, you know, and, and, and put a lot of key points in there. And then, you know, wrote at the end, this is why tattoo schools are bad. And this is why apprenticeships are good. The problem is, is that I don't expect everyone to, you know, I don't expect everyone to even be a good teacher. I think that's one of the you big know? problems. Yeah. That's, that's the hard thing too. So. Because I think you're a rare teacher. You're like a rare person who has the goods to teach about machine building and equipment and tattooing itself and everything. You have a very intimate and deep understanding of well, thank you. More I things. owe that to my good teachers. Yeah. You know, because I never had a proper apprenticeship. I didn't even know I didn't even really know about tattooing aside when I first discovered it, aside from, you know, tattoo parties in my neighborhood. No joke. Like single needle, you know, guys getting out of prison, you know, and learning how to tattoo and and doing, you know, homemade tattoo machine tattoos at tattoo parties and you pay 20 bucks and get like a little banger. <clears throat> that was like, that was literally all the knowledge I knew about tattooing. So I made homemade machines and started tattooing my friends, which was bad, <clears throat> but I didn't know. Um, and then I acquired through Rick Walter's daughter, uh, a real tattoo machine. And then I started learning about how tattooing worked, you know, like the whole, when I bought Ed Hardy's book on Sailor Jerry and read all the letters and looked at all, and I went, oh, oh, this is how, tat- this is real tattooing, you know? And I had a deeper appreciation and respect for it. And I realized that I had been totally stepping on all this, you know what I mean? Just like disrespecting and shitting on it up until then, Mm -hmm. which was very short lived, you know, and it wasn't that bad. It was only in my own eyes. No, you know, it wasn't like I went, went out and started a fucking tattoo school or something. Right. Um, (laughs) I, um, I started hanging out with real tattooers 
you know? And so I kind of got like my apprenticeship came from lots of different people. You know, I had one guy named Kevin Guglio sit down and teach me how to make needles. You know, he sat and we uh, all day, I just sat and made needles and made needles and made needles. Once he taught me how to do it all and I made needles till he kicked me out of his house. No joke. Literally he had to do, Tim, you got to go. It's one in the morning. I'm tired. You can, you know, here's some stuff for my kid. You can order all the other stuff and make needles. And then, you know, I had somebody teach me how to mix inks and it was, you know, so I had, I, I got these tattooers that saw promise in me and knew that I was hardworking and knew that, that I, I meant business. And so they were like, okay, we're going to get, we're going to open this up to you, you know? And they also saw that I respected it, that I had a full respect for it, the, the, the sacred part of it, you know, the sacred part of getting taught these things and these, these secrets. These secrets now are not secrets anymore. No. You know, they're not. And that's, you know, that's a problem too. Um, but that was bound to happen with the explosion of tattooing. The only, I think the only real apprenticeship I had was machine building. And that was what, that was probably my, that's, I mean, Dan's still my mentor. You know, I still call him up and, and ask him questions. And, and Dan Dringenberg took me under his wing and taught me everything that I know about tattoo machine building, you know? And I mean, he didn't teach me everything he knows because I still call him up and find out something new. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just kind of owe it to all these guys who, who, you know, gave me their numbers and were available for me to, to learn from. And I, I envy people that had an apprenticeship from one knowledgeable person. I do. You know, I think that's fucking rad. That is like something that I can never have. I, can ne I can't go back in time. And, um, you know, I don't, it doesn't make me sad or anything. But, uh, but that's, I think that's why I really, I really wanted to do it right with, with my apprentices, you know, because mm -hmm. I didn't get that. I got it from lots of different people, which is cool too. Yeah. And some people that had maybe a single apprenticeship from one person will hope for that. Right. Um, yeah. I think a more diverse set of knowledge can always be yeah. a good thing too. Yeah. Like Corey Miller, man. I mean, he always would pick up the phone and talk to me about stuff. I would call him up and be like, dude, what, what, what? what? I, my capacitor blew. Does the arrows go up or down? This is before I had a machine apprenticeship from Dan. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, and you know, he, he gave me this like elaborate explanation of this person and that and why it goes up that way and all this. It was so cool. He probably doesn't even remember that. So let's think about a kid who wants, thinks they want to learn how to tattoo. And let's say that kid read your Instagram post about your apprentice and how that looked and what that yeah. truly was and what that takes. Where does that leave someone who wants to tattoo today? Well, if I were that kid, I would probably start and I would start going and getting tattooed by good tattooers in my local area and then, you know, develop a relationship with them, not be an asshole, you know, um, and find maybe somebody that I, you know, a group of guys at a shop that I meshed well with. Because if you, you can't throw the dynamic off. They're not going to have you come in and be a helper if you throw the dynamic off. Right. You know, or an apprenticeship or whatever. I mean, I won't even hire. I don't care how good a tattooer is. I will not hire them if they don't mesh well with the other guys. You know, it's a family in there. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so I, I would probably find a group of guys that I mesh well with and I would hang out a lot and I would get tattooed a lot. And then an opportunity may arise where I'm like, dude, I'll run that errand for you. You know, I'll do that. And they're like, really? Like, yeah, sure. Don't worry about it. And you do it and you just be, you, 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 you show them that you're willing, you show them that, you know, that you're, that you're available and that you're willing and, and, and you, that you're humble and they might hire you to sweep up around the place. You know, we had an apprentice at the shop that, that that's how we started. He said, is there any way I, I just lost my job right now? You know, I, I, you think I could come sweep up around the place? It was my friend's son. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, man, you know, come by. And, and then four months in, we offered him an apprenticeship, you know? And I mean, or you can be like Lindsey Carmichael's son and be born into it. 
Yep. 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 You can hear more about that on a previous episode with Lindsay talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's here now. Yeah. He's probably setting up and putting my machines in the case right now and setting up my station, you know, to tattoo. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, man. I- I'll tell you about as far as that goes, I have two sons. And one of them, all he does is draw and paint. And I mean, he's already tracing flash. He's five years old and he does a better job than some like apprentices I've seen. Um, And all he wants to do as of now, he's only five. All he wants to do is be an artist and tattoo. He even knows how to separate the two. He's like, I want to be an artist and I want to tattoo. I'm like, oh my God. Why? And, and I just said to him, I'm all, hey, are you, sh- are you sure you don't want to do anything else, man? Like a doctor is a really good career. And you'd pay, you, you know, if you became a doctor, you'd pay those, you know, those, uh, those student loans off super fast because you'd be killing it and you'd be helping people. And he's just looking at me confused going, no, dad, I want a tattoo and I want to be an artist. He's um, like, look, you fucking square. Yeah, I want to be a tattooer. <laughs> totally, dude. <laughs> But I mean, of course, I'm like the coolest thing in the world right now. We'll wait. We'll see that when I'm a teenager right. and I'm I'm like ruining his life and he hates me <laughs> if he still wants a tattoo. Yeah. But uh, but people ask me a lot. They say, "Man, do you want your sons a tattoo?" And I I, the best response I can give them, I want them to do whatever makes them utterly happy. I want them to to love whatever they do. I just hope what they love and what makes them happy isn't tattooing. And they just are so confused. And, you know, I just explained, man, it's a really hard career. It's, you know, it's backbreaking work. I am living proof of that. I have three discs replaced. You know, I had to fly to to Germany where, because they don't do the surgery that I needed to fix me here and pay my life savings, everything I own, and then some credit, you know, credit cards so I could get fixed up. And I'm still tattooing. You can ask my guys, I'm still tattooing you know, long hours and working my ass off and doing it because who else is going to pay the bills? Who else is going to put food on the table? Who else is going to pay 13 fucking hundred dollars for my medical insurance for my, me and my wife and my two kids, you know, I mean, like it's an insane world we live in now and tattooing is a really hard living. It is just hard all the way around. You do not get any benefits. You do not get any retirement. There is no end game. And you can't stop. And you can't stop. What else are you going to do? you going to be an artist? You know what I mean? I know plenty of tattooers that stop to be an artist. and They're tattooing again. Yeah. You know? Um, and I just, I, you have to fucking love it. You have to love it with every fiber of your being. You know, dude, I'm getting emotional just talking about it because I fucking love it so much. And I hate that people are coming into it that don't love it that much. And, and, and I understand they may grow to love it, but you know, they, they just see glory in it. They just see an Instagram person who's doing one, a one fucking trick pony that does one type of tattoos and is, has a hundred something thousand followers and is, you know what I mean? Books closed, <laughs> no pun intended, yep. but like books closed and I'll be opening my books this time. And I have a private studio here and they look at them and they, and they, the way that the social media world is, they, everyone's online comparing their lives to other people and they want to be them, you know? And they don't see the other side of it because no one's fucking posting how miserable they are on some days, you know, and that the only thing that keeps them going is the absolute love for making tattoos, you know? So, so I just, I just, they don't get it. They don't get it right now, you know? And maybe some of them do, maybe some of them do listening to this and they're like, no, I could do it. You know, everybody told me no. And everyone told me that, you know, that it, you know, to, to get out while I still could. And this is what I wanted to do because it was so magical for me. You know, I mean, Mike Chambers said that one time in a, in an interview and I never forgot it because he described it perfectly. He said, he said that local tattoo artist was like a magician to me, you know, and he's right. It's like the closest thing to real magic that I ever felt in my entire life, you know? And if you don't feel that, get the fuck out. Why you still can. And I mean that with every piece of me. 
with all my heart. If you don't feel that this is the most magical thing, the closest thing to real magic you've ever felt, you know, at a young, at, at that young age, then you're, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You know, it's just, it's going to ruin you and you're going to end up just taking from those who love it, who really, truly love it. But that's just one old man's opinion, you know, and I say old because I'm not, I'm not really that old. It's not, it's not the age, it's the mileage. You know, I've been tattooing a quarter of a century plus, and I've just seen a lot of this, you know, time really does tell. And I, and I've just seen a lot of these people come and go and I, and there will be more and there will be more, unfortunately, but, and that's why I don't worry about it too much. You know, you can't cause you could go nuts. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you just do what you can and you just do your best to educate, you know, the young, the young people on what it really is, you know, and what it really entails and how hard, uh, you know, work you have to put in. And, um, yeah, you know what? Let me do. Let me let me move back to that real quick because because yeah. I want people to know real quick what these people what these people go through on a day to day basis to get their careers. Mm-hmm. You know, and I yeah, think that's I think it. that's important. Yep. I'll just run through it really quick. Yeah. Okay, my friend, uh, plumber, five year usually like a good five years of working under somebody. You're still working in the same time you're getting paid, but you're a plumber, you're working under someone five years, you have a test and it's unions. It's a u- union with elected officials, plumbers union, you know? Uh, my friend went to uh, barber school, just, you know, snip people up. School, f- you, you have to go to school for 1,500 hours. Um, and then you have to, and you're working, you're actually working under people. And then you have to like, you have to take a state board test and, it's like a practical exam and a written exam. So you actually have to prove that you can cut hair to pass the test. I'm wondering if that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of how tattooing is apprenticeship. You have to prove that you can do tattoos on people. You're tattooing your friends in front of them. Um, but if the barbershop school model works, then- But that's a barbershop. You're cutting hair that grows out. Right. But one could say that you could do the same thing with tattooing with the same- restrictions as you're learning and the same tests and the same knowledge that you have to gain. And I think that's where people get confused because it's one could, one could, but then who's regulating the schools, elected officials. So when do we get to that point? If when, when do the tattoo schools get to that point? You know, are they going to sidestep around that one? Like was that who's, what, who's regulating what, if they're ready Who's the one who says, who's the board? How many people are on the board and who are those people? And you know what I mean? Those are the people that say you're ready, you know? So, so that's not going to happen anytime soon unless the tattooing, tattooing gets unionized, you know? I mean, and I, and that's going to hold another discussion, you know, that a bunch of old schoolers can argue back and forth and say, no, you know what I mean? And some want to stay underground. Some want to stay pirate. Some want to stay, you know, and I'm not even going to get into my position on that either. Well, you know, briefly, though, do you think that it would benefit tattooing more to try to resist all of the regulation and resist all of the outside pressures? Dude, I don't know. Man. Or has that ship sailed and, and it's better to embrace it? I don't know. That's a dangerous question with many. Well, because we're all different. Answers. We all have different situations. You know, your your work life is different than mine, and different from the next person and the next person. Yeah, and you know what? This is. I mean, this is like climate change, man. I'm probably not going to be around to see like the war. You know, I'll probably maybe be around to see the worst of it. But like a lot of people don't give a shit because they're not going to be around for it. But then there is some that do, and there's old school tattooers that aren't going to be around for it, so they don't give a shit. And then there's ones that do, and they're like, I want to preserve this for the next generation. So I mean, ah, dude, I don't know, man. Like, do I think the horse is too far out of the stable? I mean, would it be naive of me to say no? I don't know, man. It's pretty fucking far out of the stable. You know, it is. Do I still love it today as much as I did when I was, you know, when I was a kid? Yes. Even more so. Am I still learning? Yes. Um, I don't know, man. 
is there is there is there younger generations that I really feel appreciate it and love it and care for it and want to preserve it as much as you know my generation? Without a doubt, I got a guy Javier De Luna that works for me right now. I think he, I, I think he loves it more than me. You know what I mean? And he cherishes it and wants to keep keep and preserve all the history of it and you know what I mean all that all that mumbo jumbo just as much as anyone else that I've ever met yeah. so guys like that give me hope for for the future of it for sure um well anyways I guess we don't need to know all that I've read pretty much all the uh you know the pipe fitter three years <laughs> um I think tattoo schools honestly are just a sneaky little way around getting get or it was a sneaky way of just getting around all the hard work that you that you should that you should put in. Yeah, I think all the versions of tattoo school that we've seen so far definitely are that. Yeah. It's a way for someone to profit monetarily, not in this case of this internship, but in like the actual tattoo schools we've seen in the past. It's people charging money to have a classroom full of kids that they're going to turn out in two weeks or yeah. two months or whatever it might be. And they know they're not teaching them shit. Or if they don't know that, then they don't have shit to give them anyway. Yeah. And I, you know, I will say, I, I feel like this girl, if I probably, oh, no, I mean, she, she most likely is, is not like these other schools, you know, but it's still, she, you're still in that same category, you know? She's still, you, you can't be on the far end of one category and say that, you know what I mean, that you're not this because you are, you're in that category. And then, the, and then on the opposing end of that category is some of these tattoo schools that are literally just fucking grifters, you know, they're just grifters making money and that's all they care about. And they don't care that, that, that it's a horrible thing that they're doing, you know, um, and the people that are getting involved don't know that either. They may learn it later, and by then it's too late. Their ten grand is gone, or whatever. How much this tattoo school costs? Yeah. But those, I mean, that's the worst of it. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's the worst of the bad. So, those schools are a bit easier to shut down, though. Yeah. Um, well, because it's clear that they're preying on vulnerable people yeah people who might have be coming out of like a bad experience in a tattoo shop and they're looking for something and the schools know to cater to that yeah yeah their, yeah. Whole, their whole line is this is safe you know it's a safe space we respect you we we're not going to make you work for free you're going to pay us but like whatever it is yeah yeah um I, th I think the one difference that i still see between a lot of the the careers that you talked about like the way to get in is that for tattooing, there still isn't like a way, a clear way in, or like a clear way even to get the opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's a difference because anytime there's something where you're taking like a state board well, exam. Because or, tattooers don't want more tattooers. Right. You know? And um, I think that's what it boils I down to. I think if you're meant, if you were meant to tattoo, the way is more clear than you think. You know? Yeah. Um, I agree, that's, but it's hard to tell that not, to a kid. That's not, yeah, that's and that's not an official way to, yeah, yeah. I understand that. It's, yeah. That's not black and white. That's not written in paper. But, um, but I think I'll, I think most would agree. It's written in ink, bro. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one's gonna tell you you got to sign your soul to the devil to become yeah. a tattooer. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I was already in it because I sold my soul way before that. So <laughs> it was perfect. It worked out just fine. He already owned it. <laughs> so to sum this all up, to run a circle around this whole thing, do you think that there could be a way with the right people involved to develop some sort of predetermined course or like a way into tattooing for interested people? Like, do you a think school. you could do it? A school. Let's call it a school, yeah. No. Why not? Uh, why Why do I not think it could be done, or why do I not want to do it? Not why do you not want... Why? Yeah, because I, I think we... Yeah, the gist of, every, of, of the last hour or two is... Yeah. 
of, of that, you know, but like if it was your task, I, if it was your task to do it, why do you think, do that I think you could it could do be it? done? Yes, I think it could be done. I think it is being done. I think it's just being done by the wrong people. That's what I mean. Because, because yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally fucked up. Anything is done by the wrong people because guys that, that, you know, elected officials, you know, people that would be elected officials, you know, people that people look up to wouldn't do it, mm-hmm. you know? For the reason that it's just creating more tattooers. How many ways can you slice the pie before no one's getting fed? Even the people who were sliced, you know, cut, cutting it up, dividing it up even thinner and thinner, they're not getting fed either. No one's getting fed at one point, you know? And this has happened in 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 uh, job sites, you know, or different types of careers where there's such a flood of this type of trade that – nobody's getting fed and everyone starts undercutting each other and and then then you you oversaturate the business you know that's why that's the whole purpose of why I talked about the love for it you know cuz they're just not going to love it and they're going to strangle and destroy everything that we love about it without even knowing it so yeah man it's it is i mean we're yeah we're trapped we're, you know, but unless, I mean, unless, and this is an unpopular opinion, but like either organize and fight against them or shut the fuck up about it. You know what I mean? But not really. <laughs> well, I agree that a lot. Because we're still going to exercise our right to protest. Yeah. And I totally firmly believe in that, you know. Um, but a lot of people aren't effectively protesting, as we know. They just like to throw something yelling at the wall and, yelling and screaming and threatening is is you know i think the reaction that a lot of people that i read comments by in regards to and fuss and to and fuss only strengthen her case i didn't read it well i mean what was like is it i mean think of hate I'm, hate and violence or i mean was just it? yeah bullshit like really <sighs> rude things and things that only strengthen the the fact that women are treated like shit in tattooing in the world, you know, in a lot of cases, yeah, but in tattooing, of course. they're underpaid for the same job. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's right. ridiculous. The same exact job. Yeah, it's they, like the biggest they, scam uh, going in the world. Yeah, it's it's total bullshit. Yeah. So when she's coming out to say, "I'm creating an avenue for people who aren't finding opportunities," and her whole stance is she doesn't want these art school kids who are talented and have potential to feel like they need to go to a super expensive arts college and then get in the hole and try to like make clay pots to pay their student loans back. And it's never going to happen no matter how so great what they she, are. So what's the message here? Don't be an art, don't be an artist. It's not going to pay your bills, be a tattooer. Uh, in a way. And, and that's, some, that's something a terrible I asked message. Her. Right. Well, that's what I asked because her, her goal is to just present that there are other avenues. So I asked her, maybe you should just show, many different options of what that could look like. Like tattooing is so specific that you would actually make well, more of an impact. Why not show it all? Why not just love what you do and enjoy what you do and that's it? <laughs> yeah. What's the point of it all? What is she trying to gain? I Did you her. ask her that? Mm-hmm. And what is the point of, of, all, of all this? She loves these kids. And she wants to do what she feels she can offer to help them. That's then, it. Then go teach art. She went to an art school, right? Mm-hmm. Then teach them art. That's it. You know what I mean? She might say that that's what she's trying to do. No. She's promoting them to become tattooers. She's teaching tattoo. It may not be the actual the act of tattooing, but she's teaching them tattoo. You know? I mean, plain and simple. There's you can't dance around that. That's a fact, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I just, agree. I felt like it's that's what that's, I was like. What is? I don't understand the gain of this. You know, it's a, it's is it ego? You know what I mean? Like because if you wanted to help kids, go 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 teach art at an underprivileged. You know what I mean? Like these are kids that can af- parents who can a af- fucking afford to buy a house or rent an apartment nearby. So they can get their kids in that school. That may not be all the students, but. <laughs> that may not be all the students. But I mean, go, like, if you love children so much, go devote time, do, do be of service 
in, in other ways, you know? And don't do an interview about it in the newspaper. True service isn't promoted. True service is like, like one of my employees, and he would never say this. One of my employees, Gabe, I mean, I'll sometimes walk in and be like, dude, I haven't seen Gabe. I thought, where's Gabe? And they're like, dude, he's in Haiti helping out with after the hurricane and everything. He just went down there and just did it. And he will never talk about it when he got back. He would just go down there and be of service and come back. And if you asked him about it, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, and he would probably just kind of change the subject or something because he's doing real service. You know, this isn't real service. This is, there's ego involved. There's newspaper articles involved. You know, there's Instagram posts involved. I don't fucking go down and give blankets to the homeless and then have someone take a, like take a selfie with a bum and him holding the blanket and say, look what I'm doing. That's not service. Hashtag 50 blankets today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So that's where I'm just kind of stumped. I'm just confused. Yeah. You know? I think she and maybe she news- could try to explain that to me, but I don't know how you're going to explain newspaper articles and Instagram posts, but still, you know, you're doing it for the love of the children. I think she she would say she did the newspaper article uh, solely in hopes of soliciting donors and people to monetarily fund this project, because as of right now, she's funding the whole thing. Mm. Okay. I'll be honest. The more I talk to her... <laughs> Not that it changed my mind about her angle and stuff on it, but I, I truly don't think she's a bad person with bad intentions. No, 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 no. And you know what? That was something that, oh, fuck, I forgot to talk about too. Like, There's a lot of these people. There's a lot, like, she's probably not a bad, She, you know, like, there's plenty of people that are bad people, that are fucking scandalous people, that have other families yeah. that besides their own. You right, know, they're right. cheating, they're, they're lying, they're doing, you know, I mean, horrible things, they're... The, the, you know, these are bad people, you know, she's probably not a bad person. No, she just, she's just coming at it from a different angle that the entire tattoo industry <laughs> disagrees with. I mean, that's like the nicest way I can possibly put it. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe look at that. Well, if, you know, if you're doing something in the entire tattoo industry, <laughs> disagree with i'm one to tell you that you know look at it from a different angle so maybe she needs to look at it from a different angle and be like okay why would this be bad and listen to people and but then there you go that's you know that's where you come to a head with people screaming and yelling at her and threatening her because that's going to make it hard for her to see it from your side right um I don't know, man. This is, it's really, I knew coming into this, this was going to be a difficult one. And there's not going to be, there wasn't going to be any resolve at the end of this, you yeah. know? Um, and it was like, it was worrisome, you know? Because even people on, uh, from my angle that disagree with the tattoo schools and want nothing more than to see them all dissolve and disappear um, are probably going to disagree with some of my opinions today. And I knew that coming in, you know? And that's cool. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is what needs to happen, I think. And on the show, yeah. I don't I don't try to usually tell people how to think or what to think. But on this, what I do think is that we need to be more open to considering other sides of things before we react. And if people are trying to make a point against someone like Aina Fett and what she's doing, don't go on her page and write, you stupid fucking slut. What the fuck? You, you fucking suck yeah. at tattooing. You fucking need to outline your Dude, I'm sure tattoos. some of those people that did that were just jumping on the bandwagon and didn't even, don't even tattoo. Yeah, for sure. Guarantee, for you know? For sure. So, yeah, that's not good. And and that is just completely strengthening all of these outside, like, usually wacky ideas. I mean, this is one of the less wacky, I feel like, compared to, because I spend a lot of time trying to dig into stuff to mm-hmm. find topics for the show. So I'm like really tr- immersed in like bullshit world of tattooing a lot yeah. of time. Tattooers also think they're the center of the universe. Yeah. I mean. You see that sometimes. <laughs> it's it's crazy. All the people that I talked out to, about today, pipe fitters, electricians, plumbers, doctors, crane operators, these are important people 
on a day to day basis. These are important jobs. Mm -hmm. These are jobs. If electricians all disappeared tomorrow, we would be fucked. Maybe not right then, but eventually. Yeah. If doctors disappeared tomorrow, millions of people would die and perish. You know, if plumbers disappeared tomorrow, we'd have we'd have pipes breaking on the streets. We'd be losing water everywhere. There'd be feces all over. Yeah. You know, if tattooers disappeared tomorrow, oh shit. You know, Tom, I guess I don't get to get my eagle finished, but life goes on. Yep. We are we are a bullshit job in a, in a way of, of the, if you look at it from the entire world. Yeah, in terms we, of necessity. We are, we are not a necessity. We're a luxury. We're a luxury job and we're not nearly as important as we think we are, you know? But it's important to me. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> it's a, the entire world yeah. to me. It's the entire world to my children. It's what's paid for the roof over their head, you know, the 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 shoes that they that they walk to school with in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. and and the food that that gets on their table. You know, I mean, so it's the entire world for me. Yeah. But I do understand that if tattooing disappeared tomorrow, life would continue. All life would continue normally. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people can get can lose sight of that because there is a huge importance in what we do as we're doing it. But like you said, in the rest of the world, we don't need that shit. Yeah. If there was never another Mercedes car or Rolex watch ever made again, people would be bummed, but nothing, yeah. nothing would change. Well, they got fucking clocks on their phone. Right. You know, how many people do you think wear a Rolex and they still pull out their phone and check the time? I'd probably say every one of them. <laughs> That's why I don't wear a Rolex. <laughs> I just could never see myself spending minimum five grand on something that my phone does just fine for me. If not um, better in some ways. It makes no sense. Yeah. I don't even like it. I mean, it took me years to get used to my wedding ring. I just don't like jewelry anyways. I never liked any of that stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you for tuning into the Jewelry Podcast. Uh, yeah. We'll continue next week and we'll talk about necklaces. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, and I said this on other podcasts real quick. Yeah. You know, I just like to say that, you know, if you have a conflicting opinion of what I said, um, please feel free to email me or call down at the shop and we can talk personally about it. Um, don't scream at me online. <laughs> um, but, uh, but also, I mean... I don't get, I don't have any notifications. I only get DMs from people that I follow. I just have that, you know, cut yeah. off. It's just too much. Um, so really, if you want to talk about it or discuss it, just call down to shop. I'm there Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. You can always find me there. I'm not an easy person to, you know, I'm not a hard person to find. So, yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's I, I hope I did all my, my fellow tattooers who just, you know, have the same opinions as me. I hope I did them. Hoping the best of justice that I could, yeah, you know, for our side, you know, and I, and th this is what the opinions you've heard today are the things I truly believe in. So, so fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I think I have to get to tattooing. Now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again to Tim Hendricks for being a part of this episode. Yeah. Now. As I was editing this and trying to figure out how to make it all work without the other conversation that was supposed to be included in this topic, I was thinking about how Oregon, yes, the state, not the trail, the state of Oregon has included tattoo schools as part of the necessary requirement for becoming a tattooer. And very serendipitously, as I was thinking about this, I received an email from a woman, Olivia Britz Wheat, who is part of a, an organization called Reform Oregon Tattooing. What does this actually look like? Because we can speculate all day. If we have more tattooers coming in, how will that affect us? Is that going to be a good thing? Is it going to be a bad thing? Um, when we let someone develop these tattoo schools and when they are imposed and when they are mandatory what does that actually look like and what's the impact that it has on a tattoo community so let's talk to olivia about it who is a tattooer from portland okay hello olivia hi thanks for How having are you? me i'm yeah, great of course doing great so what is the organization that you're a part of 
Um, so we're called Reform Organ Tattooing. Um, we like to call ourselves ROT for short. It's a lot easier to say. And mm -hmm. um, we're a group of working licensed tattooers in the state of Oregon who attend board meetings. We are um, essentially just trying to advocate for better legislation, um, more transparency with the state, um, a liaison between the state and the working tattooers of Oregon. Yeah. So I've been talking a lot this episode about more, more or less speculation. What is it going to look like as the way that we learn and the way that people are starting tattooing, what does that look like as it evolves? And there are more structured educational systems. And um, I think Oregon is a very unique example of something that's actually probably progressed further than almost anywhere else that I've heard of. Um, so, so let's talk about what, what learning to tattoo in Oregon looks like right now. Um, so Oregon has actually had licensing for tattooing since the early 90s. So it's been in practice here for a very long time. And it's actually written into state law that any um, any license that requires or any trade that requires a license, excuse me, um, kind of actually has to you have to obtain that license through a career school. So that's written into the Oregon law and it's been that way for a long time. So once they actually started licensing tattooers, there was a trainer's license at first that kind of held the place of a apprenticeship, but there was no curriculum. And then after a little while, they kind of just realized that they had to incorporate some sort of a school if they were to treat it like every other licensed occupation. Not that long ago, I would say like maybe eight to 10 years ago, it actually went from just the health department to now it's involved with the higher education commission. So here in Oregon, it's wrapped up in a lot of bureaucracy and it's in lots of different departments as well. And so coming in now as a group and trying to kind of sift through all of the years of misinformation and um, kind of trying to get to the bottom of how things function, how things work um, has been kind of difficult. <laughs> We've been doing it yeah, for about a year um, and attending board meetings and holding quarterly meetings with tattooers. And um, we've learned so much that it's, uh, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very intense system to navigate. Most tattooers aren't very bureaucratic by nature. So it's definitely new for all of us. Yeah. So what was it that that really inspired you to, to get working on this stuff and to, and to be working more closely with everything? Um, so I had an apprentice for three years and, um, when I was working at, um, Blacklist Tattoo, Linus O'Malley and I each had an apprentice and we didn't want to send our apprentices to tattoo school. We wanted to have control over their education and what we wanted to teach them. We wanted to give them a traditional apprenticeship. And so we elected to, start the paperwork to license the shop as a tattoo school. And it took three years of me doing paperwork with my friend Tama, who's also in the organization. It was, um, you know, she helped me for, yeah, it was about three years almost um, until they got licensed. And um, just going back and forth between the two departments, it would be, you know, six months of talking to one person and then they would realize oh, you should have been talking to this person. And so it was just a lot of lost time, a lot of money also. And um, at the end of it, um, I knew too much not to do something about it. Um, just trying to navigate that process. I mean, if it just felt like um, if tattooers can't navigate the system, we can't even teach people the way that we want to teach them. We have to basically buy into the system and start the school and, and they want us to have multiple people. They want it to go forever. It's, it's a very, um, legally binding operation also, and, um, just incredibly time consuming. So if you were to send your apprentice to these tat to one of these tattoo schools, what does that look like? How are those set up? How long does it take? My apprentice and I, once we got like almost to the point of being licensed after three years, um, we departed from blacklist and basically I had to send my apprentice to a tattoo school anyway to finish up his tattoos. And so um, 
I mean, he had a shortened kind of expedited experience because he had already done three years under me, but um, still had to be there, still do his 50 procedures. Um, and so I got a sort of a glimpse as to what it's like, and it really varies because a lot of places um, will only take one student at a time, but that's only one student tattooing at a time. They might have multiple students in the building just doing different steps until one of them can start their uh, 50 procedures as you know, what's legally required by the state. So procedures, that's like 50 tattoos? Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any benefits to the way things are, are set up? Because obviously there's things that you guys are working to reform and to, and to fine-tune, but are, are there any benefits? It's difficult to say because, um, you know, doing all that work to try to have control and then to kind of relinquish that control um, and to try to quantify all of that into a structured learning experience is really hard. It's, it's difficult to try to build a curriculum around something that so many of us have only lived in real life experience, working in tattoo shops and dealing with the public and um, working with tattooers who have been around longer than us and learning from them. And so, um, you know, when we went through and, and uh, Linus and I kind of went through the curriculum that was required by the state and we, for our school that we were building, doubled the hourly requirement, which is only 360 hours for the state of Oregon. And so we doubled it, we added sections, we, we thought it was very insufficient. And so, um, you know, to know that most schools are operating at that 360 hour uh, mark is kind of like, any person that is interested in going to a tattoo school, I would say absolutely, you have to do your own research. You have to make sure you're a proficient artist before you step foot in there because there's only 10 hours required by the state for art and design specifically. There's only 10 hours required for, um, I, I feel like most sections are about 10 hours. So it really is you get what you put in and you get what you make out of it and it's a means to an end where I know a lot of really successful tattooers that live in Oregon who they went to tattoo school, but they really hustled and they really made it work for them. They got a mentor who could help them after the fact or before just to kind of make sure they didn't pick up any bad habits. Um, Yeah, they really did their due diligence. So it's not, it's not the all encompassing school experience. A lot of people think it's going to be, and it's not getting a license doesn't mean you're going to have a career. And is it presented to these kids? Because I I just picture a lot of younger people who see this as an opportunity to start tattooing. And do you think that a lot of them are under the impression that they're getting the full experience and they're going to get the full range of, um, you know, knowledge and everything, all the tools that they need to really start tattooing once they leave the tattoo school? I think that's probably the perception. I think that a lot of people do think that they're going to learn how to draw, they're going to learn how to tattoo and in my personal experience, I think 50 tattoos is just barely scratching the surface. You're just finally learning how to deal with different types of skin and different parts of the body. And um, to, to think that after 50 tattoos and passing a test that you're essentially able to go out and work on the public. You can open up your own private studio and never work in an actual shop. You know, I think that's kind of up for debate whether that's adequate. Well, it's been a wild ride today. Thank you to Olivia Britt-Sweet for talking to me. And this is just a very small snippet, obviously, of the conversation that I had with her. And we're going to continue with her on this week's extended episode, which you'll hear on Wednesday. So stay tuned. Make sure you come on back and we'll hear more with myself and Olivia talking about matters of Oregon. As always, I'm Andrew Stortz. You can follow me on Instagram at Andrew Stortz. Uh, All the information about our guests and sponsors you can find in the show notes. And again, a huge thank you to Tattoo Smart and River Valley Printing Co. for sponsoring this episode. If you like this show, make sure to check out our website, booksclosedpodcast.com. That's where you can find all the information about every single episode ever, as well as merch and videos. And mm -mm, that's where the good stuff's at. So make sure to check that out. Make sure you catch up on other episodes because 
after this week will be on break until after the holidays. It's almost Christmas time and people travel, people are out of their normal routine. There's no time to listen to podcasts. You don't want to listen to tat shit. You're getting away from it for a week or two when you're on the holidays. So we will resume right after the new year, the first Monday of January. I don't know what the number is. I should know. I'm sorry. I was unprepared for this. We'll see you back here in January. This is just the first half of the season that we've gotten through. I appreciate all the amazing feedback I've gotten from many of you. So thank you for that. Keep it coming. And yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. We will see you in a couple weeks. Don't forget this week's extended episode. It's still coming at you on Wednesday. Bye. Ta-ta.